Thank you very much, Molly, and good afternoon, everyone. We are so pleased today to be offering our first integrative nursing webinar. And if you haven't introduced yourself in the chat, please do so. It's exciting today. We have nurses from the Philippines, Botswana, and Turkey joining us, as well as parts, various parts around the country. Throughout the center's history, we have worked in support of health professionals, including integrative nurses. And we are very excited today to be hosting as our speaker, Dr. Stephanie Hope, who will share a presentation titled Integrative Nursing and Sacred Medicine, the Emerging Field of Psychedelic Therapy. Integrative nursing is a way of being, doing, and knowing that advances the health and well being of persons, families, and communities through caring and healing relationships. Integrative nurses are use evidence to inform traditional and emerging interventions that support whole person and whole systems healing. I think today what you're gonna hear about falls into that category of uh, being an emerging intervention. The topic today um, is very timely. A few days ago, the New York Times ran a story um, titled, The Psychedelic Revolution is Coming, Psychiatry May Never Be the Same. The article featured a Johns Hopkins University study on people suffering from severe PTSD. The researchers found that when they paired MDMA, currently an illegal drug, with talk therapy, people experienced a significant reduction in the severity of their symptoms compared with those who received therapy and an inactive placebo. The results were so dramatic that after two months of treatment, 67% of the participants in the MDMA group no longer qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD compared to 32% in the placebo group. In today's webinar, Dr. Hope will talk about the history of sacred medicine traditions, current clinical science, and the role of integrative nursing. Dr. Stephanie Hope is a registered nurse, certified nurse coach, and holds a doctor of nursing practice degree. She graduated from the Integrative Health and Healing DNP specialty at the University of Minnesota in 2019. Dr. Hope has worked for the last 10 years in the fields of acute oncology, hospice, and health coaching. In 2011, she worked as a guide for the NYU psilocybin cancer anxiety trial, helping cancer patients navigate through psychedelic journeys with psilocybin mushrooms. She has published on psychedelics in the Journal of Holistic Nursing and has an article in press for the American Journal of Nursing. Stephanie also offers a continuing education course on nursing and sacred medicine. Um, welcome, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Mary Jo. And thank you so much for the Center of Spirituality and Healing for hosting this conversation and for um, just bringing the topic to the forefront. And I am so excited and passionate on this topic and I have a lot to share with you today. So I am going to jump right in. Um, I do have my email on, on this slide in case anybody has questions, you're welcome to contact me later. Um, so Molly already went over the contact hours and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. One second. Hmm. Sorry, my slide is a little slow for some reason right now. Um, one moment. Okay, so where are we starting here? Um, we are, I'm gonna actually start with a couple of definitions. So the first is uh, psychedelics. So this is the term that probably most people are familiar with and we talk a lot about psychedelic therapy. And um, the origin of the term psychedelic is mind manifesting. And so um, this is, like I said, a familiar term, but some feel that it's not quite um, the most accurate or sometimes it brings up connotations of the 60s that are maybe not true to the work that's being done today. So there's also the term um, uh, entheogens, which means creating God within or creating a sacred experience. And there's a term that I like to use, which is sacred medicine. And it's kind of a broader term coming more from traditional contexts um, of traditional people who have used these medicines for um, thousands of years. And it can actually refer to not just um, 
not just psychoactive medicine, but anything that helps one to connect with spirit. And so where are we beginning today? And I'm sorry, my slides are um, all of a sudden it's not working as well as I would like them to, but I think I can work with it. So we are beginning with in a place where we have a modern body of science to support psychedelic work with psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, and ketamine. And there's global media interest, like Mary Jo mentioned, it seems like every other day there's an article coming out in a major media publication. Um, there was Michael Pollan's best-selling uh, work, How to Change Your Mind. It was a New York Times bestseller that really generated a lot of interest a couple of years ago. And we have institutional support from institutions like Johns Hopkins uh, Psychedelic Research Unit. And there's also a psychedelic research and training unit being developed at NYU. Um, there's the California Institute for Integral Studies, which for a number of years has been offering clinical training programs for psychedelic therapists. There are institutions like MAPS, the Hefter Foundation, the Beckley Foundation, the USONA Foundation, which are supporting research and funding, as well as um, for-profit um, invest, investments from places like Compass Pathways and MindMed. There's actually been a ton of capital investment in the last year even. And there's been statewide, um, actually there's been local decriminalization acts and even statewide decriminalization efforts. And um, most recently in Oregon, they have decriminalized a number of substances, but also have on a step further than that and made psilocybin ther therapy fully legal. And um, so that means in a couple of years, once they have established a board to guide the licensure of therapists, um, therapists, which could be medical professionals and potentially also non-medical professionals um, will be able to guide patients on psych legal psychedelic um, journeys with psilocybin and people will be able to grow or produce psilocybin medicine legally. So this is a huge sea change. And um, part of my, talk today is to, to ask the question, are we ready for this? And I, I would argue that as a nursing profession, we're not ready. <laughs> and that it's a huge opportunity, especially as integrative nurses for us to step up in the conversation. So I'm gonna read a few patient stories because I know in nursing, we love to honor patient stories. These come from the qualitative literature on psilocybin and LSD studies and um, just gives you more of a, an idea of what some of these experiences were like for patients. So one patient said, I had the opportunity to relax. I rather connected to my inner world, closed eyes. It was less about my illness. I was able to put it into perspective. Not to see oneself with one's sickness as center. There are more important things in life. The evolution of humankind, for example. Your inner ego gets diminished, I believe, and you're looking at the whole. You're indeed starting to build relations with plants and with the entire living world around. You think less about yourself. You're thinking across borders. Um, another patient said, the psilocybin experience has made me more aware that I cannot just live for material stuff and success. I have to satisfy my emotional side as well, which now I'm trying to do slowly. I'm trying to do things and live experiences that would, have, that would make me happy internally. I'm not stopping following my goals, but I realize that being so intense about getting what I want does not have a point. That's from the cancer related um, existential distress study. Um, another one from that same study, just overcome with love and all the love that I have for my family and friends. I felt that it was coming from them. Also, I felt that it I was bathed in it. And if I were religious, it definitely would have been a religious experience. I would have said, said, bathed in God's love. And I don't think English really has a way to say this without using the word God. Maybe bathed in transcendent love, bathed in universal love. It was such a strong feeling. Okay, I'm sorry. I um, have to pause for a second to regroup my slides. Stephanie, if that doesn't work, I can pull them up for you too, but why don't I, you try to Oh, I think I know what the problem is. Okay. Um, 
Okay, great. I think I got it now. Okay. So on this side, we see um, some highlights of the nursing contributions to the field. And I wanted to, to bring this up um, to A, highlight some of the positive um, things that have been brought forward by some of my colleagues, but also to show that this is basically it from nursing right now, um, four articles. And there are like tons of articles being published in medicine, especially psychiatry, psychology, and, um, and pharmacology. And nursing is really lagging behind um, when it comes to disseminating information. And of these four articles, only one, the Dorson article, which is a really great one, is original research. The rest are um, review and synthesis articles. Um, there's also been a couple book chapters published. I'm currently teaching the only continuing education course that I know about. And there are two organizations for nurses. One is Open Nurses. The other one is um, International Association of Psychedelic Nurses. And um, so those are both great resources. I know especially Open Nurses has, has a great resource page if you wanna to continue to learn more after this presentation. Um, so there really is the need for nursing to raise their voices and um, to, you know, not just um, to, to participate in the emerging practice, but also to, to share information and education and advocate, advocate for these practices. So I'm gonna start off talking about sacred medicine traditions. So world traditions of indigenous people that have been using sacred plants and fungi for centuries, if not millennia, for healing and for um, raising consciousness. And so why start here? Because I want to acknowledge with heartfelt gratitude the contributions of these peoples, these medicine carriers who have kept these ways alive from generation to generation who have kept them well, who have developed um, and held the rituals that come with and around these sacraments, and to bow in cultural hum humility to say that what we've been doing largely in Western medicine, especially in psychiatry and mental health, has led us to um, a lot of dead ends, um, not to diminish the contributions that we have to contribute, but to say that we're also struggling with a mental health crisis. And let's use a little bit of cultural humility to say, maybe we can learn from these thousands of years of experience, and maybe it can help us to move towards a more holistic paradigm of healing. And so in sacred medicine traditions, um, there's a different worldview, a different way of looking at things where everything is connected um, and everything is family. So looking at the whole world, animate and inanimate as family. And, and so this um, especially incorporates the four elements of air, fire, water and earth, um, the, the cosmos, the mother earth below us, all incorporating as part of our healing and everything is medicine. Um, and that can be uh, psychoactive medicines that we're gonna talk more about, or it can be also non-psychoactive like just sacred plants as in the Lakota tradition, the four sacred plants of tobacco, sage, cedar and sweet grass, which are used for prayer and cleansing and permission, or in the um, tradition of the Am traditions of the Amazon that use dietas or use um, diets of master teacher plants that maybe aren't psychoactive, but that have a lot to do to offer in terms of healing and teaching. And so that's another thread is um, the plants as teachers. So these are considered master teacher plants and a shaman would, um, would ask somebody to ask the plant for their guidance or listen to the plant for what it's trying to share with you. And people in shamanic or healing apprenticeships, um, these, this can be, you know, go by many names, shaman, healer, curandero, taita. Um, they, they are studying these ways for often decades before they, are, before they are seen as ready to hold the medicine for their community. And so this can include um, certain abstinence, abstinences and disciplines to show their commitment and to purify themselves. And especially it's, it's a very much an ethical and moral training to, to um, show that a practitioner has the maturity to be able to hold these plants. And so these plants are really always used as sacrament and in a ritualistic context, often a group context, not always. 
um, where there are ceremonies and uh, maybe cleansing rituals surrounding the work and music and sound always um, holds an important role. So this can be evident in the peyote songs of the Native American church or the ikaros of the ayahuasca tradition. Um, in this picture, we have a picture of a, of a, of a Witi tradition using uh, iboga and um, the harp that's uh, one of their sacred instruments. And so I'm going to talk briefly about some of the important traditional medicine cultures. I could go on a lot longer, but I, I tried to distill it down. Um, psilocybin mushrooms are a Mesoamerican medicine, but also used in other parts of the world. They are called the flesh of the gods or Teonanaka by the Aztec people. They've been used for millennia. There are evidence um, of mushroom statues and um, kind of mushroom deities in early Mesoamerican art. And this tradition has been really well preserved by the Mazatec people of Southern Mexico. Their ceremonies, which are sometimes blended with um, also elements of Catholicism are called veladas. And in 1955, Gordon Wasson, who was an amateur mycologist, traveled to Oaxaca, Mexico with his wife and attended a velada with a Mazatec healer, Maria Sabina. And then he came back and was very moved by his account and shared it on the front cover of Life magazine in, the, in 1955. And that was really the emergence or reemergence of psychedelic medicine or sacred medicine in Western culture. And so we can see the direct lineage from the traditional people to our modern practices. Another important plant is ayahuasca, which is from the Amazonian basin re region native um, to people such as the Shipibo Kanibo, the Kofan, the Hunikuin, and many, many others. It's called the vine of the soul, and it's a brew of the Banisteriopsis copy vine and the Chacuna leaf, and is used as well in modern syncretic traditions like the Uniao de Vegetao and Santo Daime Church. Santo Daime Church, for example, is um, draws from elements of traditional Amazonian practices Catholicism and West African Orisha traditions. Peyote is a medicine more of North America. It's a spineless mescaline containing desert cactus. The Wixataka people or the Wichol people have maintained this tradition unbroken. They're um, a group of uh, tradition in Mexico. And in the 1800s, this medicine spread northward towards the Plains tribes of America and um, the practices kind of evolved to take on more of the style of music and different styles of those tribes, such as ceremonies being held in teepees and became um, also kind of sanctified as the Native American church, which brings in elements of Christianity and is recognized as uh, legal by the US government. The conservation status of peyote is vulnerable. It's not endangered, but it, it's vulnerable because it's a very slow growing plant. So that's something important to know about peyote. And lastly, I'll share about iboga, which comes from West Equ Equatorial Africa, like Gabon and Cameroon, and is practiced by um, practitioners of the Bwiti tradition. It's the powdered root bark of a shrub, Tabernath iboga. And what's one thing that's notable about this plant is that a derivative from Iboga ibogaine, a chemical derivative, can be used to treat opioid withdrawal symptoms. It's very powerful at actually ceasing withdrawal um, for about two weeks. But it's also it's a medicine that is can be dangerous. Um, it can cause cardiotoxicity, so it requires careful monitoring, and is one of the reasons why it's not currently legal in the U.S. Though that might change in the future. So I just wanted to honor these cultures and these plants and traditions and kind of give you a taste of where this work is coming from. Now a little bit of the history of the, on the kind of pharmacy Western medicine side, LSD was first synthesized in 1938 by Albert Hoffman. Um, he actually created it as an anti-hemorrhage medication and accidentally um, got some LSD on his hand and realized the psychedelic properties and had a very famous bicycle ride, um, you know, not recommended, but <laughs> under the influence of LSD. And um, it was not practical to produce on a large scale until the 50s or 60s, I mean, until the 60s though. 
Uh, psilocybin was synthesized also by Hoffman from samples taken by Gordon Wasson um, from his time with Maria Sabina. So the synthesized psilocybin came directly from the inspiration of the actual mushroom medicine. MDMA was synthesized first in 1912 by Anton Kolisch at Merck and Alex Shulgin at Dow, uh, Alexander Shulgin at Dow Chemical did further experiments in the 1970s to really realize the empathogenic effects of MDMA. And ketamine was developed in 1962 as an anesthetic and it continues to be used as an anesthetic and pain medication, but also can be used to treat depression. And so we will go further into each of these medicines. So hundreds of studies of LSD and psilocybin were, were done in the 50s and 60s. And um, they had a range of um, therapeutic uh, paradigms, but many of the paradigms that were created then are what was used as a starting point for the clinical science that we're seeing today. Um, many of the studies were government funded and in the 1960s, because of changing, um, because of growing recreational use and just shifting social changes, as well as some indiscretion on the part of some clinicians and researchers, um, there was a big backlash. And the Controlled Substances Act was instated in the 1970s, in 1970, which um, scheduled psilocybin and LSD as Schedule One substances, and then MDMA joined them in 1985, meaning that they have no currently accepted medical use and high potential for abuse. And that's how they remain scheduled today. Um, and ketamine is, is, is Schedule Three, so it is legally able to be legally prescribed. And so in 1991, Rick Strassman went through the onerous process of getting federal permission to conduct clinical research with DMT, another psychedelic, which kind of just cracked open the door for research to, to re-emerge. But it wasn't really until um, probably the 2000s that it kind of got rolling again. So that was a good 30 year period of not being able to kind of continue the scientific and clinical pursuit of these medicines and, and use them with patients as well who could have benefited them from them. So I'm gonna get into the current clinical science because I know that as health practitioners, you want to know how these medicines can help your patients and even your loved ones. So this is a picture of the clinical paradigm, the room and the therapeutic context where psilocybin therapy is conducted. You can see it's thoughtfully decorated. And it's not just um, you know, a drug experience. There is three preparation sessions before and three integration sessions after the experience with two trained therapists to build relationship, to prepare and create an intention for the journey to see what, um, to, to anticipate what material might arise. And so these clinicians could be doctors, psychologists, social workers, nurses, chaplains. Um, and then the patient has a dosing session, which is eight hours, and it could be either psilocybin or a placebo. And those sessions are several weeks apart. During the dosing sessions, they are encouraged to lie back, put on an eye mask, listen to headphones playing, instrumental music. So once again, we see music as really pivotal as part in part of the psychedelic experience. Um, and they have their two guides there just to offer reassurance and encouragement. And generally the encouragement is if frightening material arises to lean into it and to confront it, to go deeper into the experience. And what is you know, usually described is that sometimes there is increased anxiety during the session and then decreased anxiety profoundly decreased anxiety afterward and long lasting decreases. I'll get into more details about that. So one of the first studies done with psilocybin was the spiritual experiences study by Griffiths and colleagues at Johns Hopkins with, um, in which they provided um, psilocybin to healthy volunteers and not to study um, any clinical diagnosis, but just to study if they could occasion a mystical experience. And they found that psilocybin does 
reliably occasion spiritual mystical experiences. And they measured it with all sorts of questionnaires and scales like the mystical experiences questionnaire. Um, but most notably about the study, 67% of the volunteers rated the experience with psilocybin to be either the most meaningful experience of his or her life or among the top five, similar to the birth of a child or death of a parent. So that is pretty astounding. And that has been consistent with um, other trials of psilocybin. And I love this study because it shows the potential not just to treat disease, but for human development and human flourishing. Um, then there were the cancer-related existential anxiety studies. These were two studies of the same um, clinical paradigm and research protocols conducted at Johns Hopkins at NYU. They were published in the same issue of Journal of Pharmacology. And it's using psilocybin as a treatment for patients who've been diagnosed with cancer to treat their existential anxiety related to the cancer. So not to treat the cancer, to treat the existential anxiety. And this was a randomized controlled placebo controlled trial. And it showed immediate reductions of anxiety and depressive symptoms in both studies, clinically and statistically significant that were largely maintained at six months follow-up. And amazingly at five, almost five years later, 60 to 80% of the NYU participants met criteria for clinically significant antidepressant or anxiolytic responses. So five years later, after one dose of medication, these um, effects persist. Psilocybin is also being investigated for depression. Um, there was a trial for major depressive disorder, which compared psilocybin assisted therapy to delayed treatment, which showed significant immediate reductions in depressive symptoms after dosing. And this was a significant di difference between groups with large effect sizes. And very recently, um, just last month, there was an article by Carhart Harris that actually compared psilocybin to uh, escitalopram, an antidepressant for, um, I think, I believe this was for treatment resistant depression and showed actually no difference between groups, meaning that psilocybin is at least as effective as an antidepressant um, in treating depression. So there was no statistical di difference in the primary outcome measure, but psilocybin actually performed better on all the secondary outcome measures as well. So this is a area um, that is ripe for further exploration. And in 2019, the FDA granted breakthrough therapy designation for the treatment of both major depression disorder and treatment resistant depression for psilocybin. And this means that it kind of fast tracks um, the process a little bit because it's a promising therapy for a life-threatening condition that doesn't have um, enough promising therapies. There've also been some pilot studies using psilocybin in conjunction with therapeutic programs for smoking cessation and alcoholism. I don't have time to get into all the details on all the studies, but those were very interesting and very promising results. So some of the kind of themes of the science is that once again, this is a single dose effect. Um, it's not a medication that you have to take every day and it's really the experience that the patients described as healing. Um, there are plenty of neuropsychology and neurobiology studies about what's happening in the brain, like alterations to the default mode network and um, neuroplasticity and maybe even epi epigenetic changes. But the patients described powerful experiences, powerful experiences with uh, resolving unresolved conflicts, having insights, um, having communion with loved ones or communion with a sense of God. And so some of the themes that they describe in the qualitative literature include exalted feelings of joy, bliss, and love, embodiment, ineffability, alterations to their identity, and movement from separateness to interconnectedness. And in many of these studies, mysticism was found to be a mediator. So patients who had a kind of full, fully qualified mystical experience were found to have better outcomes in terms of anxiety and depression. 
Um, LSD has similar effects to psilocybin, but it, it lasts longer and so is not as practical for research. Um, I think there is going to be more research with LSD upcoming, um, but there has already been uh, at least one pilot study associated with life-threatening illness, so treating the existential anxiety and um, decreases in trait and anxiety scores with large effect size were reported and results were maintained at a year with no serious adverse events, just mild transient side effects. So I'm going to shift gears and talk about MDMA. So this is a medication that um, could be called an entheogen or a psychedelic, but some people feel that empathogen or enactogen is a more apt term. It's, it's, not, it's not classified as a classical psychedelic, which primarily would work on the serotonin system. Um, so these terms empathogen or enactogen refer to having um, increased experience of relatedness, openness, empathy, or in inward contact with oneself. MDMA um, recreationally is known as ecstasy or molly, but what's important to keep in mind is that this might not be pure MDMA. It often can be cut with other substances um, when used in the community. And the treatment paradigm for MDMA is a little bit different than with psilocybin. It's actually MDMA assisted psychotherapy. So the participants um, are offered patient centered manualized therapy, once again with two prepared therapists and with preparation sessions and integration sessions, um, but they have therapy and talking during the sessions. And so the MDMA is, is thought to enhance the effect of the therapy. Um, some other differences is that they, they usually stay overnight for monitoring and have more frequent contacts during integration. And so the research for MDMA has primarily been used for people with PTSD, and there have been six phase two randomized controlled trials completed for crime victims, veterans, first responders with PTSD, finding significant reductions uh, with moderate to large effect sizes in PTSD symptoms for MDMA versus placebo with results sustained for a year. Um, and so MDMA was also granted fast track, I'm sorry, was granted breakthrough therapy uh, designation by the FDA for treatment of PTSD. And there is a phase three study that Mary Jo referenced. It hasn't officially been published in Nature yet. It kind of had a sneak preview in New York Times. But as she said, 67% of patients who worked with MDMA no longer met criteria for PTSD after two months as compared to 32% of those who had placebo. It also does show the effect of the therapy. You know, 32% responded to therapy plus placebo, but MDMA greatly enhanced that therapy. Um, there was also a pilot study done using MDMA for social anxiety in autistic adults with, um, with positive effects on anxiety. Ketamine is a different class, once again, of, of what you could call a psychedelic. It's an anesthetic. Um, it can be used for pain management, and, but it can also have dissociative and hallucinatory effects at high doses. Um, it's currently Schedule 3, so it's legally able to be prescribed. And sometimes it's given just as a medication without any therapeutic support for depression or suicidal ideation. And it has an immediate effect with IV or IM use that lasts about one week. So um, that can be enough time maybe to avert a crisis or it can be uh, maintained with further therapy protocols using IV, IM, or even PO, sublingual, or intranasal ketamine. And um, esketamine, which is an intranasal treatment, was granted FDA fast track and breakthrough therapy for treatment resistant depression in 2019. Um, so in the past, this really has been looked at as kind of um, similar to uh, any Western medical um, medication, the medication that has an effect on the brain. But there's a kind of more emerging paradigm. It's been around for a while, but becoming more popular of ketamine assisted psychotherapy. So um, using this medicine either at low or high doses in conjunction with therapy or in conjunction with um, psychedelic support to treat 
a wide range of conditions like depression, alcohol and drug dependence and other conditions because it's really at the discretion of the provider since it's a legal therapy um, and it can, can be given in a range of forms. Um, in, this, in this ketamine assisted psychotherapy model, um, it's a preparation dosing integration model. Somebody, Kolb, who did a lot of research with this medication in Russia for um, alcoholism, um, he would have people come inpatient and change their diet and exercise and engage in spiritual practices and group therapy before having the experience. And he described a range of effects from empathogenic to out of body experience to near death experience and ego dissolving transcendental experience and found that the last two categories tended to provide the best clinical outcomes. Um, so there's a lot of things being done in the community with ketamine. Um, there's a study that um, was not like a clinical randomized trial, but showed significant um, reductions in depression and anxiety stories with patients undergoing uh, various methods of treatment. So because we're all nurses here, I'm sure everybody also wants to know about safety. And so I'm going to just touch on safety for each of these. Um, for psilocybin, it has very low toxicity. Overdose is nearly impossible and only transient effects are usually have been noted in studies like elevated blood pressure or anxiety during the session, which, which are transient. Um, on the contrary, um, in the community, um, there was a, a study that showed 2.5% of psilocybin users acted in a physically aggressive manner and 2.5% sought medical treatment. So that really shows the importance, I think, of the preparation dosing integration model of the therapeutic context that can help to ensure the safety that both the physical and psychological safety of the participants. MDMA is um, a substance that is chronically and recreationally used in the community. But once again, this can often be an adulterated substance. And so chronic use has been associated with memory and cognitive processing deficits, difficulties with sleep, um, deficits in psychiatric status. So that's why the para therapeutic paradigm is designed for just a few uses with pure MDMA at known doses that are not neurotoxic with therapeutic support and there haven't been adverse serious reactions in the clinical research. Ketamine also has the potential for, um, for dependency and can be associated with impairments in working in episodic memory, executive functioning, overall psychological well-being, as well as bladder toxicity when used chronically. So for that reason, some pr practitioners prefer to give it only in office, potentially only in IM or IV doses so that it, it's not something that can be used at home. Um, but other pr practitioners are also, um, are also using other paradigms. They are doing PO and intranasal dosing at home. And so it's up to the discretion of the provider. And I think this is really one of the places where it's important for the nursing voice to come in and advocate for safety and advocate for best practices. Because the truth is that as these medications become legal, there are gonna be a range of, um, of ways that they're used in the community. And as nurses, we can provide education and advocacy so that we can try to create the best outcomes possible. So now I'd like to speak a little bit about um, psychedelic therapy and the role of the nurse. So um, Janice Phelps um, wrote a seminal article um, identifying the six therapist competencies for a psychedelic therapist. So I'm gonna read these and you can kind of just like sit back and see what comes to mind when I read these six competencies. So there's empathic um, abiding presence or empathetic abiding presence, trust enhancement, spiritual intelligence, knowledge of the physical and psychological effects of psychedelics, therapist self-awareness and ethical integrity, and proficiency in complementary techniques. So to me, a lot of this reflects the qualities of a nurse and especially of an integrative nurse. For example, empathetic abiding presence that a nurse develops at the bedside with patients for eight to 12 or more hours going through experiences like birth or death or an anxiety attack or whatever might come up. 
or trust enhancement, I mean, nurses have been rated the most trusted professionals for the last 20 years. So I'm gonna read a, um, a quote from this great article by Andrew Penn that he wrote with Janice Phelps and also Jean Watson, the nurse theorist, which kind of creates a foundation for a theoretical foundation for nurses as psychedelic therapists. So they wrote that nursing care supports the natural orientation of the human body and mind toward wholeness. The role of the psychedelic therapist is not unlike that of the nurse midwife or hospice nurse. They permit a natural process and support the natural process of healing to occur. Instead of tending to the unfolding birth or death process, in psychedelic assisted therapy, the nurse therapist is a focused attendant to the emotional, spiritual, psychological healing of the patient, largely permitting natural emergence of a native process our drive toward wholeness. I love the way that they put that. Um, and so we can look a little more deeply at each of the integrative nursing principles and how they apply to this emerging practice. So integrative nursing is, is whole person based. And so this is so congruent with psychedelic therapy where it's actually being used as a spiritual therapy, which is really novel in medicine. Um, so tending to the, the mind, body, and spirit of a person. Um, second principle is that humans have the innate healing capacity that drive towards wholeness. And so psychedelics really do mobilize the patient's deep inner resources, especially with psilocybin therapy. They're encouraged to go within and find their own lessons from the medicine and from themselves. And the guide really holds space for that process. Um, the third principle is that nature has healing properties that are important for well-being. And um, these medicines, as I said at the beginning, were derived or inspired from plants and fungi. And many of them are now synthetic, um, but they kind of come from traditions that or were inspired by traditions that are very nature-oriented. And there has been some research to show that participation in psychedelic therapy increases nature appreciation. And I, I, I can speak to that from uh, my experience as a psychedelic guide with the NYU trial that people afterwards want to spend more time enjoying nature and finding peace in nature. The fourth principle is that integrative nursing is relationship-based and person-centered. And so this is um, integral to the process of psychedelic assisted therapy where um, you know, many hours are spent creating that therapeutic bond and relationship between clinician and client. And um, in the qualitative literature, the movement from separateness to interconnectedness is a theme of patients' experience. And even um, I, uh, Alex Belser, one of the art authors, described this as being a relationally embedded medicine, because even when people are going on their inward journey, they're almost universally describing encounters with loved ones. The fifth principle is least to most so that we should strive to use the least invasive methods before more invasive methods. And psychedelic therapy is not the least invasive. <laughs> it's, it's an intense experience and it might not be appropriate from everyone. In all of these studies, there are screening criteria. Um, for example, having a family history of schizophrenia or a personal history is um, disqualifying in, in the current research. Things may change in the future, but it's not appropriate for everyone. But it's also not the most invasive option because this is a one-time or maybe two-time therapy that has lasting effects. It's not a medication that you have to take every day that might have pretty devastating side effects. And lastly, um, integrative nursing honors the importance of self-care and care of the caregiver. And so self-care is extremely important in, in, in psychedelic therapy. Therapist guides need to have a high level of self-reflection and, self, uh, and spiritual maturity. And so in a lot of the training programs, which are extensive, usually taking place over a year or more, that is what's really highlighted is self-reflection. And, and, and one's own personal spiritual practices. And it's also important to recognize that with these medicines that treat trauma, the nursing and healthcare community has been through a lot of trauma 
I mean, in general, as a nature of the profession, as a nature of the systems that we work in and the moral distress that we're often faced with, and especially in the last two years, um, we can see, you know, there's a lot of healing needed. And in studies with MDMA, one of the um, components of the training for therapists was they had the opportunity to experience the MDMA therapy for themselves so that they knew what they were offering their patients and so that they could also have that healing experience. So I would just like to end by giving a call to the nursing profession to be bridge builders. Um, the voice of indigenous wisdom keepers has largely been absent from the current discussion, although that's starting to change. And I think that integrative nurses are translators and integrators, and we can bring together the best of ancient and modern wisdom for the interest of patients and of society. And we have that high level of ethical integrity and trust that is required to move this forward in the public sphere. So nurses not only have the opportunity and maybe the responsibility to get involved in research and therapy, but also in education and advocacy so that we can move this paradigm forward and grow it together. So I have um, lots of references here for you to dive into if anything sparked your interest. And once again, I want to say a heartfelt thank you to all of you for coming with open hearts and open minds. And thank you to the center for this opportunity. And thank you again to all the medicine carriers of the world and all the researchers that have that brought us to the place where we are now in this Renaissance. So thank you so much, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Well, thank you so much, um, Stephanie. I feel like I learned a lot in that presentation. So a number of questions have come in. The first one I'll pose to you, um, how does one get trained as a guide? You mentioned in your talk that sometimes it's as long as a year, the training process. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And where does are there many facilities that do the yeah. training? There are more and more coming up every day. One of the most well established is the California Institute for Integral Studies. And that has been operational for a number of years. And there they provide a certificate in psychedelic therapy, which I believe um, can be used to participate in clinical trials as a therapist. Um, there is an organization, ONCA, which um, has an interesting component of really bringing in the indigenous traditions and incorporating four pilgrimages to four different countries to study with indigenous people and their medicine. Um, there's the Synthesis Institute, which has an 18 month training program that they're just launching that's based in um, the Netherlands, but it's a worldwide training program. So those are some of the bigger ones that, I, that come to mind, but um, there are others as well. So Stephanie, are you aware, are there any documented um, use of psychedelic, psychedelic therapy in teenagers or young adults, especially regarding depression, anxiety, and suicide, and suicidal tendencies? Um, not that I know. I don't think so. I think we're, we're still in the earlier phases. Um, and so I don't think there, that there has been any clinical research in that area yet. So this is a question about the, the full psilocybin process. What are the timeframes for the full process? Like how far ahead are the three prep sessions, the time between the medicine and the three integration sessions? Is this a months long process? Yes, it's months long. I, I can't recall exactly, but I want to say something like a few weeks between each preparation session and a few weeks between the dosing and placebo, and then a few weeks between in each integration session. Um, and the integration preparation sessions, I think, are something like an hour or 90 minutes. And the dosing sessions are eight hours. So yes, it is, it is quite a, a lengthy process. And somebody else writes, can you talk about the contraindications for those with psychosis or a family history of psychosis? I've also heard someone on an SSRI may not get the full psychedelic effect. Um, so yes, right now in terms of research, um, like I had mentioned, patients with psychosis or a family history are generally excluded from trials. Um, and, you know, this is for, for safety and for demonstrating the efficacy of these medicines in a more general population. That's not to say that there's not a place for these medicines with uh, people with those kind of psychiatric histories, but it seems like 
it's something that would require more careful research and more, you know, more care in, in the approach. And it's kind of like maybe that research will be coming down the line. Mm -hmm. And there are um, certain contraindications with other psych meds, and I don't know exactly um, offhand to be able to tell you what they are, but certainly in the trials, participants are screened very carefully and may have to go off of some of their medications. So there's a kind of a group of questions around making a referral. Um, somebody asks, <clears throat> how would a nurse refer a patient? And then another question was, does, does insurance typically cover these therapies? So right now, there these treatments, um, well, ketamine, ketamine is legal, but not covered by insurance. And psilocybin and MDMA are both in the research phases. So if you have a client that you think could benefit, you can... Um, check out if they're eligible for a clinical trial. If there's one happening near them, you could go to maps.org. That's Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Um, I think they have a place there where you can search the clinical trials. Um, so that, and that's a good service that you can do to move the field forward because these trials need participants. And then as well, the, um, it can benefit patients who are eligible, but unfortunately, you know, it's only a small group of patients that will be eligible for those therapies right now. Um, like I said, that's changing in two years in Oregon. That's going to be a completely different landscape with legal psychedelic therapy available. Mm -hmm. So I think you've kind of answered this question, but maybe to just reinforce it, Terry, somebody asks, where in the Twin Cities can I refer a patient for therapy consideration? And really the only therapies now available are under clinical trial research studies. And yes, unless it's for ketamine therapy, yeah. in which case you can look into finding a, like a provider that is, that is doing that therapy when there are providers all over the country. Um, and, but that is um, not covered. So it's out of pocket, it can be expensive. Um, so that, that is an option if you have somebody suffering from depression. So another question, what education and training do you get to help people to deal with trauma and issues that unfold during the session? Or is that a different kind of a therapist that would handle sort of the post um, psychological mental health work? Um, so in the training for the, uh, for those training programs that I mentioned, um, training and trauma awareness and different therapeutic approaches is part of the training. Um, but also it is important to, to, you know, follow up with patients and provide aftercare if three integration, integration sessions isn't enough. And maybe the, the client really needs to continue to have an ongoing um, relationship with a therapist and particularly a therapist that is trained or well-versed in psychedelic therapy, or um, there are therapists and clinicians out there right now who are integration therapists. So they don't um, administer or accompany anybody on a psychedelic journey, but they do provide from a harm reduction standpoint, um, integration therapy to help people to integrate any difficult experiences or, or great experiences that they've had with psychedelics and, and help them to move through that. Great. So somebody writes, um, for those who are resistant to therapy, but open to psilocybin use, are there microdosing scenarios that could be administered instead of the prep sessions and eight hours? So microdosing is something that has become like um, more popular and it seems like it's something that is happening in the community and there are people who have put out their recommendations for microdosing, but it hasn't been studied clinically. And so that's why I didn't include it in this presentation and um, personally can't really speak very much to it, but I think that is something that's, that's upcoming. So microdosing is taking a sub therapeutic dose. I mean, a sub, like a sub psychedelic dose, sub, sub perceptual dose where um, you wouldn't actually experience uh, much in the way of any psychedelic effects, but, um, and it's something that you would take every day and mm -hmm. can have supposedly benefits for depression. Some people argue that it's just a placebo effect, although I guess we should never really say just the placebo because placebo and the mind body connection is very powerful. Um, so a lot more research is needed um, to understand microdosing and how to do it safely and, and what the effects are. 
So this person asks, are you saying that drugs promote um, spiritual intelligence? Mm -hmm. So the, these medicines can engender a spiritual experience. And so some patients might say something like, I always wanted to believe in that we're all connected, but I never really felt it until, um, until I had this experience and now I know it. Or I think one of the quotes I read earlier was from a woman who is an atheist and still describes herself as an atheist. Um, she was featured in a film that I was featured in as well. But she said she couldn't help but say I was bathed in God's love. And afterwards she decided that it wasn't God's love, it was universal love. But that was the impulse that it created for mm -hmm. her. So the, I would say that yes, these medicines, these drugs can create a spiritual experience. And then the hard work of it comes in, in making meaning of it. So in creating intelligence spiritual intelligence that I don't think is a given. I think that ha that comes from the therapeutic work of integration. So Stephanie, there are so many comments in the chat. People have just really loved your presentation and many people are wondering where to get more information. And we've been reassuring people that we'll send out your slides. Somebody writes, um, does Stephanie have a social media where we can keep up with the latest research? Yes, um, I have an Instagram which is at nursing sacred medicine. Um, and yes, that's a good place. And then also um, nursing sacred medicine .com, which I believe is gonna be sent out in the follow-up email. That's the um, website for our course, continuing education course. And there's also an email list you can sign up for there for a newsletter where I do send out periodic updates on the research. And then somebody else writes, would you recommend that interested um, people get information from the Minnesota Psychedelic Society organization? Um, I am not really familiar with that organization, but I know that there are lots of local organizations and local decriminalization efforts. So I would say that if you are interested to connect with whatever is happening locally, for sure. Great. Well, I just want to thank you, Stephanie. This has been an amazing um, presentation. And I want to acknowledge also and thank all of our staff at the Bakken Center who helped make today's webinar possible. Um, I'm so excited that we got so many people from not only around the country, but around the world. And so um, that really is so consistent with our desire at the Bakken Center to really have a global reach. We hope that many of you will join us for our next integrative nursing webinar on August 11th. It'll focus on the interconnectedness of nature and health and will be led by Dr. Eric Tipko Olson. So you can visit the website at csh.umn.edu to learn more and to register. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you.